So guys, as you know, we're here with uh, David Gledhill for our live Q&A. And if you don't know Dave already, um, which I'm sure you do, he's uh, an ex RAF F4 Phantom and Tornado F3 Navigator, and now uh, an absolute prolific author. So uh, I want to introduce him as a friend as well. So Dave, why don't you chat about your books and any upcoming projects you actually have? Well, as you probably know, I mean, I started off the books, I mean, Phantom in Focus was the first book that came out, um, and that was, uh, that was a factual book. Um, and that was published by Font Hill Media back in 2012. And uh, really, I looked at that, and I, I started to look at the, uh, the Phantom as an airframe, uh, but also to try and follow through how we, uh, how we actually use the Phantom, you know, all the way through from training, um, the Phantom as a weapon system, weapons, uh, the threats, you know, all the kind of stuff that we, we would have come across on the squadron. And then finish off with a little bit with, um, you know, the future and where we thought it was going to go. And that was the first effort. And to be honest, at that stage, I wasn't sure that I was, I was going to produce any more books, you know. But uh, very shortly after that, there were a couple of other topics that came to mind. Clearly, the other airplane I'd flown, the Tornado F3. And that was book number three, Tornado F3 in focus. So that followed quite quickly. Um, add to that, I'd spent quite a lot of time in the Falklands, and in fact, my last flying tour was as boss of the, uh, the tornado flight down of the Falkland Islands. So I, I decided to produce a Falklands book as well. So they were the three core books that I started off with on the factual side. As those started going, it, it, I, I kind of figured that the, the, the fiction side of it might be quite good fun. Uh, I'd, I'd written many, many years ago a, a book called Defector, which looked at a Soviet uh, 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 test pilot defecting into the West with, a, with an Su-27 flanker. I'd never been able to get it published through traditional means, so I thought, well, why not self-publish? So I pushed it out when I was in Kindle, and, and it kind of took off. Awful lot of good reviews, and, uh, and people were interested in it. So again, a couple of novels followed in fairly short order. So I had a pretty good match of, of fact and fiction, um, but based around principally the Phantom with a little bit of Tornado thrown in. So they were, the, they were the core books, if you will. Um, and then a few other topics sort of followed on, and uh, I did a little picture book, which wasn't a serious book, but it did showcase the, uh, the photographs of a, a very good aviation photographer, Darren Wilman. But really, my part in that was quite small, and it was just a, effectively rather extended captions. And then two more books, uh, Operational Test, looking at the sort of test type flying that I'd done. And that was testing principally electronic warfare systems. That was called Operational Test Honing the Edge. And then finally, the last book that came out was called Phantom in the Cold War. And that was a book about uh, the Wildenrath years. So um, the, the F4 in its role in Germany. And for the first time, I, I actually did some research down at the uh, National Archives down at Kew. And, and I looked at the operational diaries, which back in the day would, had been secret. So, uh, but these things are now available to the public and you can go in there into the National Archives and actually read them yourself but secret stamped all over them. But I look principally at the 92 squadron operation on this record. Um, uh, it added a little bit of sort of flesh to the, uh, the, the stories that I'd known in my three years at Vilna and added that extra bit around, you know, before and after I, I served on the station. Um, I was also able to add things like war plans and um, some of the operational detail that, of course, we hadn't been allowed to admit during the Cold War. Uh, because it was highly classified, but now all open source of the National Archives. So those are pretty much the, the, the books that I've covered. Um, uh, three more novels have followed, uh, looking at uh, Falkland Islands, uh, there's one set on the west coast of Scotland, the QRA type scenario, all quite fun and, uh, you know, just a little bit of, uh, of, a, of an aside, if you will. Um, the next project is going to be a joint project with Phil Keeble, who many on here will know, um, Phil, ex Phantom pilot, we served together on the operational conversion unit as instructors. And uh, Phil and I have got together and we've co authored a book which has just gone to the uh, publisher now. And this will be called Paradua uh, Training an RAF Phantom Crew. And what we're going to do in that book is we're going to look at um, the journey from school days, effectively, all the way through sort of uh, air cadets, um, the, the, the life before the Air Force. And then looking at the basic flying training, both for a pilot and for a navigator. Um, and then Phil looks at advanced pilot training. And uh, I look at the sort of lead-in training that I did as a navigator, all the way through to the squadron, looking at the conversion unit, and then looking at that first sort of 
six months to a year as you arrive on a squadron, operational work up, up to operation. So that's the latest one. Hopefully that should be out later on in the year. So in a, you know, a potted history, that's, uh, that's the books that I've covered over the last sort of five years or so. So, Dave, obviously, obviously, you can see the you can questions, questions coming in. So, if you are willing to answer a few of the questions, that'd be brilliant. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm just looking down. Uh, first one I've come to: Did the UK Phantom have the Sony scope the Yanks had? Um, I'm thinking by Sony scope. That's from Ian Mangum. Um, I guess by Sony scope, you mean the the Tizio system. Uh, the Americans had a very complex uh, um, electronic system called Tizio, and I'm, I'm going to struggle for the name, but it's basically uh, uh, a thermal imaging sighting s system. And this had uh, this fed out onto the radar in the back cockpit, I believe, um, but essentially it gave a visual picture at long range. And this was out to 20, 30 miles, but essentially an electronic sort of uh, means of identification. Um, very complex, uh, very high tech, which we never had. Um, typical Brit fashion, we had, a, uh, we had a substitute, but it was called TESS, and that was the telescopic sighting system. And this was literally a, a rifle scope that sat in the back cockpit. It protruded out of the left-hand side. Funnily enough, the original prototype that I flew in Germany was fitted in the right-hand quarter light, but the, the, the actual one that went into service was in the left-hand side. Um, and essentially, this was half a Centurion tank sight. And what you did was um, the pilot would lock up the radar in the front cockpit. Um, we had a sidewinder steering dot, which gave a pure pursuit course to the target. So if the pilot stuck that dot in the center of the radar scope, you would point straight at the target that you were locked up to. Uh, so in other words, it would appear in the bore side of the airplane. So what happened was if I peered into the shifty scope, which was on the left-hand side of the cockpit there, with the pilot with the dot centered, then I would see the target in that optical sight. Um, it was magnified about, it was 10, 10 degrees field of view, magnified about six times. So essentially, um, uh, I could see a, a, a target at low level out to about five, six, seven miles, that kind of distance. Uh, whereas for real, um, with the unaided eye, you'd probably talk you two to three miles uh, to get that kind of fidelity. So that was the system that we had, TESS, in the, in the Brick Phantom. So uh, quite a lot simpler. Um, looking at the next one, how long would you stand uh, QRA? 24 hours was the question. Yeah, our, our QRA stints were 24 hours. So you were holding Redness 5 or Redness 10, uh, Redness 5 on Battle Flight in Germany, Redness 10 on the UK squadrons and down in the Falkland Islands. And you did a 24 hour shift. Um, at any time during that 24 hours, you could be scrambled. Um, Essentially, you sat, you listened to the telebrief. Uh, more often than not, you sat and listened to the television while you were waiting because there was nothing else to do while you were there. Read a book, watch a movie, listen to the TV. Um, if the sector operations center that controlled you decided to scramble you, then the hooter would go off and you'd run out to the airplanes and you had to be airborne within that readiness state. So, readiness five, you had to be airborne in five minutes, literally wheels in the well. Readiness 10, you had 10 minutes to do it. So a lot harder in Germany than it was in the UK or the Falkland Islands. Um, you sat for 24 hours, came on, on normally about 8.30 in the morning, uh, prepped the airplanes, cocked them to your satisfaction so that your cockpit was set up and you wanted it for a scramble. And then if the hooter went, off you went. Um, invariably, you didn't fly. A um, lot of training scrambles. Uh, the odd live launch. I sat QRA down on Southern QRA down at Wattisham. Obviously, the chaps up at Lucas has got an awful lot more flying because of the live Russian types activity. We did occasionally help out the, uh, the, the Northern Q uh, by heading north after the tanker. So invariably, Q1, Q2 would be launched out of Lucas, go off and find the Russians, uh, intercept them. Uh, and then we would launch with the tanker from Southern Q and take over probably after about an hour on task. So the longer exercises, we tended to get involved as well. But sadly, I... Uh, I did get launched to, to support Northern Q, but sadly I didn't see a bear that day. I found a Nimrod instead, which was a bit of a shame. Okay, next one. Um, yeah, somebody's already answered the question about Tizio. One from Adam Cotton. Dave was becoming a navigator, and the term always seemed a bit of a misnomer to me, your first choice of aircrew role. 
or as part of your preferred role when you join the RAF. You, you, you're uh, you're going to steal my thunder here, Adam, because uh, funnily enough, that's uh, my opening remarks in the new book that I've written with Phil covers exactly that point. Um, uh, I was a pilot before I joined the Air Force. I, I've done my uh, flying scholarship as, a, as an air cadet. Uh, I had my private pilot's license before I joined the Air Force, so I, I was able to fly. But I did join as a navigator as a preference. Um, having said that, I wasn't offered pilot at the time. I went straight in as a navigator. Um, and, and the reason for that, I leave, I leave it for the book to come out, and then hopefully you'll buy a copy of the new book when it comes. But essentially, no, I, I, I wasn't a frustrated pilot. I, I was more than happy to go in as a navigator. I suspect had I joined as a pilot, I would have ended up in the uh, right-hand seat of a C-130 rather than the... Uh, uh, the front of a Jaguar or whatever. So, uh, no, very happy to have been uh, been a navigator. Keebs is on. <laughs> what was it like to be boss of 1435 flight down the Falklands? Well, um, it was great fun. Um, it was a very unusual organisation down there. Uh, the way the station was set up was I had the, the tornado flight, so four aeroplanes. I had... Um, five crews, including myself, all active crews, and I had 55 troops. Uh, my job was to haul off the Argentinian hordes, or hold off the Argentinian hordes for 48 hours until uh, the, the, the islands could be uh, reinforced from the UK. Um, we could have done that quite happily. We would have had a good holding action. Uh, great fun. If somebody had said, here's a, here's a trip north in a, in a uh, TriStar, do you want to go now? I'd probably have said yes. But having said that, it was probably the best job, flying job, that I did in the Air Force. Very much left to our own devices. We had our job. We knew what we had to do. We had to defend the islands. We had to hold QRA. And absolutely sacrosanct was keeping two aeroplanes on road in this 10 at any one time. And uh, providing we did that, that was just fine. You know, nobody gave us a hard time. So it literally was my own little train set. OCOPS ran the organization down there. He was the airport manager, if you will. Um, there was me as OC-1435 with the Tornadoes. There was OC-1312 with his two C-130 Hercules. And there was OC-78 Squadron, uh, who had a couple of Chinooks and at that time a couple of Sea Kings. So, um, and we all looked after our own individual airplanes. OC Ops did the overall coordination. And the station commander was obviously the, uh, the head of the station. Great fun um, and, and a, a superb tour. And uh, yeah, one of the, uh, one of the highlights. Question from John Ellis. Did your F4 have rear seat controls? Um, some did. Um, the, the OCU had much more twin stickers than the, uh, the, the squadrons. On a squadron, you had generally 10 aeroplanes. Of those, one would be a two sticker. Um, two sticker in the back of the Phantom was an awful lot different to the, uh, the single stick. Um, the stick sat in the center, which meant that you couldn't pull the radar out of its stowing uh, in, 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 the, in the back cockpit. So you literally had to lean over the stick and, and look at the radar in its stowed position. So it gave you a lot of backache, gave you a lot of neck ache. Uh, your, your helmet was heavy on your head. And what's more, the hand control was moved over out of the way and, and the radar controls were, were, were slightly um, amended. So not a very comfortable uh, uh, cockpit, the, the back of the two sticker. Add to that because of the rudder pedals. And generally speaking, in the back, you wanted to keep your feet clear of the rudder pedals so that you didn't interrupt big walls in the front there. Um, which meant that you had your feet planted on the floor instead of in a comfortable sitting position. So that got to your back as well. So most of us had broken backs, uh, having flown in the back of an F4 for any, any length of time. Um, it, it was uh, on the OCU, we had about 50% two stick aeroplanes. So quite a lot more than we had on the squadron. Um, the, the advantage of the two stick aeroplanes was that you had additional flight instruments in the back. The basic uh, flight instruments in a single sticker were quite rudimentary. Um, in the back of a twin sticker, you had extra dials and knobs and um, uh, engine instruments and, and a whole bunch of stuff. But that sat in the middle in front of your face. Um, and obviously in a single sticker, eventually the chaff and flare system was there. So there were limitations, there were pluses and minuses. Um, Okay, there's one from John Ellis. Fun facts on RAF FAA pilots were initial cadre instructors at Top Gun. Uh, yeah, um, I wasn't aware of that, but uh, we have a massive exchange problem, uh, exchange program over in the United States. 
we have pilots and in the past navigators on a lot of American squadrons, including some of the very modern current airplanes. We have a pilot, for example, flying the F-22. We have test pilots at Edwards Air Force Base. We have pilots on most of the current US airplanes, F-15s, F-16s and what have you. So yeah, we're, we are very much involved on US squadrons over the States. Um, but um, yeah, it, 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 it happens and it's, it's, it's very good. Equally, the Americans work here. For example, we have a pilot that flies with 41 Squadron on the Typhoon, test and evaluation, and they're embedded across the Air Force. That's called an exchange duty. So you, you are an American if you're over in the States. So um, you, you're, you're not a paid spy. You're there to do the job, and you're doing it as if you were wearing an American hat. So very much part of an American squadron while you're there. Uh, question from LZ. As a NAV, how did you deal with motion sickness? It's a very good question. And again, I've brought that up in the next book um, because it is something that NAVs had a problem with. Never had a problem as a pilot. Uh, when I was flying the little airplanes before I joined the Air Force, never even thought about motion sickness. You climb in a Phantom. Uh, first of all, the big problem is you're dressed with all the kit. Uh, you're wearing uh, fairly heavy underwear, uh, a bunny suit, an immersion suit. A uh, life-saving jacket over that, a bone dome on your head. Uh, you're strapped into the seat with all the combine harness of the seat. You trust up like a chicken by the time you get strapped to the seat. So you're very hot. Um, add to that that your office turns upside down. So uh, at any time, you know the the, the world could be uh, any way up. Um, funny things cause motion sickness. Tanking was one of the ones that used to get to me. Um, but the fact that you're trying to talk the pilot into the basket, and the basket is just by your right ear roll here, and you're doing the commentary to get the guy to plug in, and, and it's a gentle rolling motion, and that can be very uh, airsy. Um, if you're hot, you're flying at low level, turbulence and all that kind of stuff. It's all It all adds up. So, yes, a lot of navigators did uh, suffer from motion sickness. What do you do when, you, when you're sick? You, you throw up in a bag and you get on with it. Uh, because if you don't, then you can't be a, a functioning crew member. So you, you have to understand that if you do get airsick, you have to work through it. Um, for me, I was quite sick on the conversion unit when I went through, uh, quite regularly. Um, and I was about six months on the squadron before it stopped. And thankfully thereafter, I, I didn't suffer other than perhaps when I'd had a ground tour. Maybe away for three years, you'd come back and suddenly that motion sickness is, is back just briefly. But uh, it's not something that it's easy to work through. So, uh, yeah, tough and a good question. It, it, is a, it was a struggle in the Phantom particularly. Um, Martin Strumpfer, uh, how did the Phantom compare to other RAF types in a dogfight? Well, it, it, the, the Phantom wasn't a dogfighter. Um, basically, it, uh, it was a high wing loader, so it didn't turn particularly well. A uh, rough example, a Phantom might be 16 degrees a second turn rate. Uh, an F-16, for example, might be 23 to 26 degrees a second. So quite a bit more agile than a Phantom. How did the Phantom cope? Well, you, you fought the Phantom to its best advantage. You, you didn't get into a tight turning fight. What you did was you got into a two-circle fight and came back at him from the opposite direction. Uh, try and widen the fight and then use the weapons in order to give yourself an advantage. So you would come at opposite sides of the circle, lock up and shoot a Sparrow missile in the head on, later an A9L in the head on. So using the weapons to uh, get over the disadvantages of the lack of turning rate. That said, the Phantom could turn quite well. And um, it's not always the case of just being in a one circle fight with a high agile airplane. Um, you know, the, the, a lot more goes on in combat. Okie dokie, uh, Mikko from Finland. Given my experience in RFG, how would you rate the opposing Warsaw Pact Air Forces? Good question. Were they good tactically? I believe their fighters operated under strict GCI control most of the time. Absolutely spot on, Mikko, yeah. Um, we didn't rate them that highly, but they did have numbers, and they were at that time in the Cold War, 70s and 80s, much lower tech than we were. Um, having said that, Later exploitation probably suggested that their kit was a little bit better than we gave it credit for in, in some cases, not in all. Um, so um, essentially, we thought we were going to come across a numbers game. So we would be we had higher technology 
but we would be outmaneuvered by numbers, straight numbers. Um, we didn't think they were very good in terms of training. We thought their tactics were quite rigid. We thought that by employing typical NATO combat tactics, we could beat them at any one time. But that is a fairly judgmental view, and I suspect pilots being pilots, you know, come 24 hours, 48 hours into the war, then they would have learned quite quickly and probably been let off the leash. So a little bit of a generalization, but that was our perception, that technically and procedurally we were better than they were, but they had the numbers. John Ellis, you mentioned single seaters, but I thought, except the QF4, they're all two seaters, so do you mean single pilot and was there Rio? Uh, no, sorry, on that, John, what I meant was single stickers, not single seaters. There were no single seat phantoms. In fact, the RAF phantom couldn't be flown without somebody in the back pocket because the systems that have to be lined up gives you the inertial navigation system as an example. So, no, I meant single stickers. So, um, stick in the front, pilot in the front, navigator or pilot. If a pilot in the back, you would fly in a twin sticker. If it's a navigator in the back, you would prefer to fly in a single sticker, but occasionally there'd be a stick in the back. Um, Okay, Mike JF, uh, did the Rolls-Royce Spays have more impact, uh, more impact with thrust than the J79s or F4Ks? F4K, F4M, so the FG1 and the FGR2 had the Spays slightly different versions of, but essentially the same sort of um, performance. The FG1, F4K, had slightly faster burners, but occasionally they were modded out. Um, so slightly slightly better burner performance because of the carrier requirement. Um, but essentially, the FG1 and the FGR2, they were pretty similar. J79, whereas the SPAY was a bypass turbo, turbo. so in other words, um, it was optimized for low level, more frugal, um, more performance, um, went farther on the same amount of fuel. Um, the J79 was a jet, so the minute you took the, the J79 to height, it was far, by far the better engine. Uh, down low, it used more fuel and uh, was smokier uh, tactically. That is not a good thing. Therefore, there were pluses and minuses. But I would say probably if you ask most people that flew both types, most people preferred the J79 engine to the, to the SPAY. Um, the SPAY had various problems. It wasn't as reliable as we thought it was at the time. It had lots of reliability issues, which I hadn't appreciated until I wrote the recent book. Um, the J79, good jet, but incredibly smoky. So you enter a fight, everybody knows you're coming because you're, you're, you're at the end of a smoke trial. And that really was not a good thing. You know, you didn't want to do that. Okay, another one from John Ellis. Uh, did you ever see a MiG-21 up close in the air? Sadly, I didn't, no. But that was just a function of what I was doing at the time. I've seen MiG-29s up close, but not from the cockpit of a Phantom or a Tornado, sadly. But lots of people did. Um, uh, we have evaluated the MiG-29 quite extensively. Um, uh, when the Germans uh, inherited a squadron of MiGs, then there were an awful lot of opportunities came up there. Um, I'll say no more. But uh, yes, we, we evaluated it quite, quite closely. Um, but I was never lucky enough to fly against it in the air. But a lot of my friends have, and, uh, and I've spoken to lots of people who have flown both it and against it. So, yeah, great aeroplane, but very short range. A bit like a Lightning uh, in, in broad concept, a point defense fighter, um, short, shortish range radar, but more capable than the Lightning radar. Um, very good man machine interface, weapon system highly optimized, um, great, great weapons. The, uh, both the uh, AA7 and the AA11 are very capable weapons. And the helmet mounted sight is an absolute boon, and I wish we'd had one in either of the Phantom or the Tornado. Uh, Mike JF, thanks for signing the books at Coningsby. My pleasure. <laughs> okay. Another from Adam. Uh, Dave, did RAF crews ever go supersonic in the Phantom? I'm guessing it was a pretty rare experience. No, quite the contrary, Adam. Um, uh, going supersonic was fundamental. Um, if you had to intercept a high-level target or a supersonic target, you had to go supersonic. Um, a supersonic target, you wanted to give the missile the best chance, and by going supersonic, it added to the missile capability. You could fire a missile farther if you were supersonic um, than you could if you were subsonic. 
Um, but to get to height, you had to be supersonic. We had a very strange acceleration profile in the Phantom. Essentially, you would climb to about 25,000 feet in cold power, and then you'd bunt over and go into burner. Push down, accelerate through the Mach up to about 1.1, 1.2 or so, and then pull up to the troposphere, normally, uh, tropopause, sorry, normally about 35, 36,000 feet. And at that point, you'd do a, a series of sort of bumps and pulls and bumps and pulls to get as fast as you could. And generally in a Phantom with tanks on, that would be uh, tank limited at Mach 1.6. And at that point, you could pull for the shot. Um, if you were taking a long range sparrow shot, that might be as far out as 25, 26 miles. So uh, against Concorde, for example, when we, we operated against Concorde, you were looking for a, a shot at something like 28 miles against a Mach 2.2 target. Um, and, and you had to have done the supersonic profile by then. And ideally, you'd be looking for at least 1.3, 1.4. Um, I The best I ever saw in an FGR2, I made Mach 1.9 and 60 odd thousand feet. Um, but no, it was it was a very common place. We went supersonic pretty much every week, um, and, and quite often you needed to. Okay, if I've missed any questions, please ask them again. I'm just running down the list here. Uh, Airlight X, Dave, tell us what happened when Steve Griggs Jag was shot down in the early 80s. Righty, I told this, uh, so I'm, I'm stealing my thunder here, um, but I told this story in Phantom in Focus, so the, the, the full story isn't there. But in essence, um, we were on exercise. Um, when we generated, generally speaking, we, we loaded a full weapon load, so four Sparrows or Skyflash, four Sidewinders and the gun. Um, and then at that point, we were declared on state, so we're in as 10 to the, uh, the Sector Operations Center. And at that point, normally, they stood us down, the ground crew took the weapons off, and then they scrambled us to go flying in the low flying area. When the crew flew the, uh, the, 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 the fateful mission, uh, they were launched with a full weapon load on. Um, we used to transit out to the low flying area at low level at 250 feet. And uh, there was a, 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 a geographical feature called the POL on the uh, on the River Rhine. And we would coast or we'd pass overhead the POL and that left us open into the low flying area. Um, that was the southern end of low flying area two. And as the crew went out into the low flying area, they found an airplane on radar. They did a stern attack onto it, so rolled in around the back, and, and basically, uh, the, when you looked in the cockpit of a Phantom, um, the training acquisition units made it look in the cockpit as if you were carrying a full weapon load. So to all intents and purposes, the pilot thought he had the normal situation as if he was on a training mission. The only difference would be the airplane would feel much heavier because he was carrying eight missiles and a gun. Um, he rolled around the back, he got an acquisition, and he pulled the trigger. And sadly, the sidewinder came off and, and, and destroyed the Jaguar. Um, the, luckily, the, the, the wingman saw the explosion as the, as the sidewinder struck, called his, uh, called his leader to eject, which he did, and came down in his parachute and survived. Thank you. Thank goodness. Uh, but yeah, very, uh, uh, very unusual situation, but basically you know, flying with an armed weapon and, and, and a, a, a mistake was made. Okay, another one from Martin Strumpfer. Uh, how did you prepare to fight the Russians in the late 80s with the Phantom, considering the increased maneuverability they were getting, MiG-29 and SU-27, an old tech in Phantom? Um, no difference. You, you fought a MiG-29 and SU-27 the same as you would a MiG-23 or a MiG-21. Uh, try and hold it at arm's length. Try not to get into a, a turning fight, because you would lose, uh, particularly against a MiG-29 or an SU-27 and try to employ the weapon system, the head-on shot, and the Fox 1 across the circle. Um, don't get in a knife fight in a phone box with an SU-27 or you will lose, particularly as they both have helmet-mounted sights and can look and shoot. And with an agile missile like the AA-11 Archer, again, you will lose. So the aim was employ the standard tactics, stay loose, try and get in unseen if you could, and, uh, and, and basically shoot and run. Okay, Mike JF, during interceptions, what could you tell by the profiles of the aircraft you are intercepting and interpret it? Um, the answer to that is you couldn't. All you could see on a Phantom was a blip. Uh, 
there was no way other than the radar warning receiver to tell what you were intercepting. If it was a radar armed airplane or radar equipped airplane rather, you would see indications on the little radar warning receiver in the back cockpit there. And by looking at the bleeps and squeaks, you could decide what it might be. Um, it was an imprecise art because it was very old technology. So you're never absolutely certain what it was, but you could get a good clue. The MiG-23 flogger was quite distinctive, for example. Um, if you knew what you were going against, you might be able to adapt the tactics. But to be frank, you used fairly standard tactics against most of the Soviet type airplanes that you would come across. If that answers the question, I hope. OK, John Ellis, even if the F-15s were told not to knife fight the MiG-29. Uh, ah, we didn't get to the end of the question. Oh, sorry, even the F-15s were told not to knife fight the MiG-29. Yes, well, likewise, um, an F-15, an F-15 Charlie against a MiG-29 Alpha or a MiG-29 Charlie should win because it's got longer weapons, longer stick. So, yeah, don't get in a knife fight. Um, if you do, uh, it's less predictable. Um, and you might lose, even in an F-15 against the MiG-29. So yeah, the smart tactics is beyond visual range, shoot and scoop. Uh, absolutely right, yeah. Um, another one from Ian Mangum. Uh, did the UK have the extendable nose, nose wheel? Um, the FG-1s did in the early days. Um, it, certainly 892, when they were operating from Art Royal, had the extendable nose strut. Um, I believe it was modded out quite quickly. I'm not sure. I believe the 43 Squadron ones at that time had them, um, but it was modded out very early on, certainly before my time. I never saw an extendable nose wheel, but there again, I never flew the FG1 with one minor exception. So, yes, it did, but it went quite quickly. Okay. Um, another one from Miko. Could you tell us how the F3s? Uh, how Tornado F3s and Point Defense Hawks would have been used together. I've understood that the F3s would have used their Fox Hunter radar to vector Hawks to their target. Yeah, it was called Mixed Fighter Force Operations, and um, there were various tactics, but principally the big problem with MFFO was that um, the Hawk basically ran into a brick wall at about 480, 500 knots. Uh, in a tornado, you'd probably want to enter the fight at that sort of speed. Ideally, probably shoot and then blow through, ideally at 600 knots plus. Um, but the Hawk would stay in turn. Um, so the idea was either you could detect the, uh, the, the targets on radar and ask the Hawk to extend ahead and try and talk them on into the fight, into the merge. Or alternatively, and more likely, you would drag them along in some kind of loose formation as you entered the fight. And once they were visual, they would take over and they would then manoeuvre visually. Obviously, Hawk T1, no radar, therefore it's all visual. The other tactic, and it was one that we employed on the tactical leadership programme, would be the F3s would set up in a fighter area of responsibility, so a box. Uh, radar cap looking down where you expected the threat to come from. And then you could position the Hawks on a visual cap uh, about halfway down the box ahead of you but at right angles so that they're not showing on the radar. So at 90 degrees, they wouldn't show on the radar very much. Um, you could then, again, talk them on, or alternatively, in being ahead, once you started talking about the contacts, they would pick up the, uh, the, the, the idea of where the contacts were based on calls from the bullseye, which was a reference point, and then they could work out from their own situation awareness where the fight was, and then enter the fight. So... Uh, a couple of ways to employ them, but the big disadvantage of the Hawk was A, it only had two 9Ls uh, and a gun, and, and B, it, was, it, it, it wasn't very fast, so it could be a bit of a problem getting it into a fight because of its slow speed. Okay, question from John Ellis. Do you think the F-35 is a good jet and worth the cost? In his opinion, yes. Uh, yes, I do think the F-35 is a good jet. Um, a lot of you get a lot of talk and a lot of uh, ill-informed opinion about the F-35. The F-35, the spec, is fantastic if it works. But you'd say that about every brand new aeroplane, including things like Typhoon, including Tornado, whatever. Um, it is far more complex than most people understand, simply because most of the capability of the aeroplane is at highly classified levels, way above secret. 
Uh, so most of us will never understand what the full capability is. Um, it's underdeveloped, of course. Any airplane when it first enters service is, is underdeveloped. Include with that the F-15, the F-16, the F-18. It takes time to develop an airplane. Uh, it will be developed over the years. Um, it is a compromise, though. It's a ground attack airplane principally. Uh, it does have an air defense capability, but um, as as a uh, as, as a low observable airplane, some call it stealth. Um, you have to trade off some of the performance in order to get that low observability. So it's not as punchy as a Typhoon, for example, because a Typhoon has two big jets down the back end, very hot, but not very stealthy. Uh, the F-35 is a compromise, single engine and, uh, um, and uh, enhancements to avoid the signature problems. It will come good. Uh, it will take time. But yes, I do. I do think it's a good jet. And we haven't even scratched the surface of what it's able to do yet. One from Mike JF. Did you ever come close to banging out during your flying career? I'm ever so uh, happy to say that no, I didn't. Had a few engine failures over the years. I had one where I thought it might develop into something quite nasty. The, the, the closest I came to actually uh, popping my clogs was nearly bumping into people. And that happened on a regular occasion. Um, but no, I, I, was, I was very lucky for that. Um, very good indeed. Dirk Diggler, did you ever fly the US Navy F4J? No, I didn't. I didn't fly the Brit F4J either, but I did get about 12, 15 sorties in an F4F, which was very similar to the, uh, the F4J, other than at that time when I flew the F4F, it had the old pulse radar. Uh, it had just got the Peace Ryan modification, which was the digital radar, but it didn't yet have APG-65 and MRAM. So I never saw the Gucci F4F. But uh, effectively, I flew the airframe, which the F4F was very similar to the A model, um, uh, J79 powered. Uh, but sadly, the, the kit in the back of the F4F at that time was, was a shadow of the capability of the FGR2. Another one from Ian. What was the max speed at sea level with uh, the Spay Clean? I'm assuming that is without tanks. Um, it was, the, the FGR2 was supposed to do Mach 2. I never saw it. A couple of people did, I believe. As I say, the fastest I ever saw was about Mach 1.9. Down low, um, when it first came into service, it was supposed to do about 850 knots. Again, I believe some people did. Um, the release to service limit throughout my time was 750 knots at sea level, and it was perfectly capable of doing that. Um, it took you a little time to get there, a little bit longer than it did in a, in a tornado, but um, it was able to do it quite happily. A no, no, bit noisy in the cockpit at, at 750 knots, uh, rattle your teeth, but, uh, but yeah, able to do that. Um, Okie dokie, I think I just missed one there. Was there any scope for the Phantom? This is from CSST. Was there any scope for the Phantom to have been upgraded further? New radar engines, etc. How effective would it have been? The, the obvious answer is yes, um, there was quite a big upgrade program planned as it went out of service in the early 90s. Um, not new engines, um, but avionics upgrades. There was talk at one point of putting a Lurks on leaning edge route extensions, various other bits and bobs. As always, it was money. Um, as soon as you get a new airplane coming in and the tornado was slated at that time, um, MOD is reluctant to spend money on the older airplane. So essentially you, you really struggle it's called planning blight in in staff officer terms once you know a new airplane's coming then within about five years of an airplane going out of service you're not allowed to spend money on it so yeah we could have done a lot more um but i doubt that we would have been allowed to sadly okay um yeah a couple of comments about top secret and then if he told us he'd have to kill us yeah sadly i can go to jail in two countries but uh, so i have to be careful about what i say at times Okay, another one from Adam Cotton. Dave, any idea on why the Lightning was never developed into a two-seat interceptor? Would it have been a more effective interceptor, thus modified than the Phantom even with its poor endurance? I think, Adam, that endurance is the key. Um, the Lightning, it, it, it was almost embarrassing how little fuel it had. Um, and, and the old jokes about you're airborne and calling bingo ready to come, uh, come back is quite, quite apt. We used to get airborne from Coningsby. We'd RV with the Lightnings up at Bimbrook and then head up to Area 17 over in, uh, in Cumbria. Um, 
it, the Lightnings would do one interception and then go home. Uh, we would stay for four, five, six up in Cumbria and then go all the way back to Coningsby. So fuel was its biggest problem. And it, it you know, short of filling conformal tanks, it was never getting any better than that. Could it have been developed? Yes. And, and logically, you'd have stuck two Sidewinders on instead of two Red Tops or two Fire Street because Sidewinder was a much more capable missile, particularly in the 9L variant. Um, and that would have, that would have been helpful. Uh, I, I'm not a lightning expert, so I don't know what the concepts were for, for developing it. But to me, that would have been the, the, the most logical step. One from John Ellis. Did you have a sonic boomer target? Uh, an unknown fest as a show of force. Um, yeah, you need to read Phantom in Focus. Yes, I did. <laughs> but I'd give away my story if I told you that. You'll have to buy the book. <laughs> okay. One from Tau 2 2. If it had all kicked off, did you expect to survive it? Um, no. Um, in Germany, we expected to survive about three days. Uh, either the Russians would probably roll over us or would have been taken back to UK. Um, in UK, I think it would probably have gone nuclear. Therefore, we'd probably have all struggled to try and get anything airborne at all. So um, the answer is no. Uh, most of us were, were pretty sure that within a week, we'd probably have popped our clogs. Okay, John Ellis, think the tornado will end up as a private warbird. Uh, the only way it will is if it happens in the States. Uh, I, I have my doubts. Not many F3s survived because of the RTP uh, uh, return to produce program. Um, and certainly the ones that I know that survived probably couldn't take engines. So, no, I think, I think realistically. You will not get a high combat airplane like the tornado or the Phantom Airborne in the UK under a CAA license. It just will not happen. Uh, so that would mean it would have to be in the US. OK, 10 minutes left, folks. So more questions. One from Keebs. Tell us a bit about operational testing. Um, that, again, that's one of the books, um, Operational Testing, Home in the Edge. Um, operational testing was basically to but the key question was, can a first tour pilot cope with this weapon system? And is he able to do that in the air, in the cockpit, as a first tourist? Um, what we did, and I was principally involved in electronic warfare testing, uh, we would take a system, we would take it to a test range, and we would evaluate it. Um, if development testing was aimed to see, say, for example, the electronic warfare system, the Zeus system, the Harrier GR5, GR7, GR9, Development testing would prove that you could turn it on, that it wasn't going to turn the aircraft upside down, that it transmitted the right bits and bobs, and that basically it worked. Operational testing said, now, if you're going to test this against an SA-6, does the wiggly that you send out the front, does it jam the SA-6? Does it stop the missile from hitting you? So in other words, it's effectiveness testing. Um, and that's the difference between the two elements. Um, we would do testing on all elements of electronic warfare systems, so the active jammers, the radar warning receivers, the chat systems, the flare systems, and you name it. Um, I wrote a whole book on it, so if you'd like to uh, look about uh, that topic any more than Operational Test Home in the Edge, which I co-authored with David Lewis, uh, another uh, very um, experienced operational tester. Um, and we went into it in quite a lot of depth, but a fascinating subject that sadly is not very often uh, discussed. Um, one from John Ellis, have you ever seen study the upgrades to the F4, Israeli or Japanese? Sadly, I haven't, no. So I, I really couldn't comment on that. Uh, never flew them and never really studied them at all. To be frank, um, we, were, we were never going to um, uh, get to that level of capability with the F4 because of money. Um, the Israeli, I understand, is very capable. The Japanese is, is very capable. The one I did have a little bit of experience of was the final st uh, standard of the F4F, which was, again, extremely capable. But no, I didn't, I didn't do any. Uh, I have no great in-depth knowledge. Mike JF, which aircraft do you know would be the ideal intercept for the UK, although the Typhoon is awesome, such as the F-15, for example? Um, back in the 80s, when the Tornado F3 was coming into service, I think if you've asked any crew, um, the, the F-15 was underdeveloped at that time. It was the F-15A. Uh, we were only being offered the F-16A and the F-18A, both of which really were very basic at that stage. 
So if you'd asked any of us which aeroplane we thought was best to defend the UK airspace, I think we'd have all said the F-14. Um, at that stage, the F-15E wasn't an issue because it didn't exist. Um, the F-14A was the basic one, um, and the F-14D was in concert. So I think that is the one that we would probably have all preferred. And when you think about it, the UK uh, is essentially a big carrier, and that was what the aeroplane was designed for. So we would have probably said, which would you prefer? We were always sold on the fact that the F3 would be, uh, okay, it had airframe limitations, but the weapon system would make up for those limitations. And sadly, A, the weapon system didn't work in the F2, uh, and it took five years to get it to a basic standard and then 10 years to fully develop it, as I wrote in Tornado F3 in Focus. Um, and secondly, um, the, the, the politics just dictated that we were going to get the Tornado, that the decisions had been made. Um, the Typhoon is an awesome aeroplane, and I did have one trip before I retired, but I did spend 10 years on the project, mainly on the electronic warfare side. And trust me, it's a very capable aeroplane. Um, not just is it good at air shows, but it's very capable in the air. And the EW system is awesome and works extremely well. Uh, so uh, uh, one man can do it, one woman can do it nowadays. Um, so, uh, you know, the days of needing an navigator are gone because the man-machine interface is so much better. Um, the, 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 the interface with the weapon system, one bloke can fix it. Okay. Another one from Ian. If you could go fly in any fighter jet in the world, what would you go for? If that means what uh, what trip would I like to go fly if I had the choice tomorrow? I think, I mean, sadly, it's not an option because it would be the F-22, I think. Having sat in an F-22 and seeing what it looks like and knowing the capability from briefings, um, truly awesome. And I am... I'm just in awe of the guy that gets to fly at the Brit that's over at uh, Lange. Uh, he must be a very lucky chap, and, uh, and I wish I was doing it. Having said that, there are some other great jobs out there, like, for example, on the Aggressor Squadron over at Nellis. And I used to watch the guy go flying when I was uh, the uh, liaison officer there, feeling very, very jealous. But, uh, yeah, uh, F-22 would be brilliant. Uh, having said that, what's on my bucket list? A trip in a Spitfire. I would. Yes, I think I might even buy that. So there you go. Um, okay. Uh, Mike JF, Tomcat Rock, shame it had to retire. I agree. Yeah, great aeroplane. And uh, uh, a couple of my friends flew it on, on exchange and, uh, and are very complimentary about it, particularly in the D version. Uh, superb aeroplane. Yeah, extremely good. Ian, uh, question. What do you think when we sold the Harrier and when we were up and running with the F-35s and the new carriers? I can't answer the last bit. Because uh, I'm too far out of the loop now. What did I think when we sold the Harrier? Uh, bit of a shame. The GR9 had only really come to full capability, and it was a very capable airplane indeed. Did its job extremely well. Arguably much better than the US Marines version that uh, that supposedly um, it was sold off for spares for. Um, but sadly, that's politics. Um, it is cheaper for the MOD to retire a, a, a whole fleet than it is to. Uh, they call it salami slicing the rest of the fleets. It's not good if you start to cut back on a few tornadoes, cut back on a few harriers, cut back on a few buccaneers or whatever, because then you still have to support the whole thing, uh, spares, aeroplanes, people. Uh, if you get rid of a whole fleet, you save a bucket of money very quickly, and that was the decision. It was either the harrier or the tornado. Uh, to me, the harrier was the logical one to go if that was the decision. Uh, but the tornado was seriously under threat at that time. So it could have been the tornado, uh, GR4, that went at, at the time. Uh, but it did a different job and was able to pick up some of the Harrier jobs more easily. Okie dokie. I'm seeing Mike. Is that Are we running out of time? Yes, we are. Unless you want to stay for another 10 minutes, Dave, it's up to you. But uh, I think we've had a, a great Q&A at the moment. Mm -hmm. I've got one, uh, another one here then. One from Darren Headland. Uh, yeah, very good, Darren. Thanks. I uh, hope to see you at Newark as well. Um, yeah, we'll uh, we'll catch up. Um, another one from Tau Two Two. Which Soviet fighter would you most like to have a go in? Um, I think the SG Twenty Seven or any of its variants. Um, it's um, I've got to be careful what I say, but it's an extremely capable aeroplane, um, and. Uh, yeah, to, to have a shot in that and to see its capabilities would be extremely interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'd better say no more. <laughs> uh, 
Any uh, any more? SU-47 or SU-57? Yeah, I don't think I'll ever get chance to fly in one of those. But uh, is that the uh, that, that, that's the new? Was it Pac-41? Uh, Pac was it? That, that, yeah. You post in the comments one more question. Dave will answer it, and then we're going to sign off. One from Ian. Uh, did anyone you know or yourself buy the F4 Phantom carrier landing game? <laughs> um, <laughs> I never had it as a kid, but uh, yes, um, it did appear on one. Uh, uh, it was an air crew luncheon at RAF Collingsby uh, as we took over as 56 Tornado Squadron. And uh, we, we went for lunch in the officer's mess at Collingsby, and the F4 carrier landing game appeared in the uh, dining room uh, halfway through the meal. And there were an awful lot of um, very drunken aircrew landing F4s on carriers, so uh, <laughs> lots of fun. Uh, did the F3 have a bombing roll, an emergency bombing roll? Um, sort of. Um, the F3, particularly in the Falklands, had a ground strafe capability, so we would use the gun in the ground strafing roll. Um, uh, but that was really only a secondary option. It was a holding action. Um, Bombing roll, we developed, as many people know, the EF-3, so the uh, the wild weasel version of the Tornado F-3. Um, it was a very capable system, and I mentioned some of what its capabilities were, not all, but some, in Tornado F-3 in focus. But uh, as part of that process, we did actually integrate the Paveway 2 onto the F-3, onto the EF-3. Um, and the idea being, um, you could either take an alarm missile or a Paveway 2, into the target, jam it on the approach, and then neutralize it. So D add as well as C add um, in that in that uh, particular role. Um, so that was the only time a bomb ever went on an F three, and it took quite a bit of doing. So yeah. So I want to thank you personally for coming on the show, and I'm, I'm guessing maybe we can get you on the show again to talk about uh your future book release with keebs i'm sure like the people on the side would would love that maybe we can do a joint q a live q a with you guys yeah. and um if i hopefully... could just say again, though if uh, um a little bit of a plug for the novels that are right if uh, although the factual books are, uh, are the the ones that sort of give credibility if you will uh, a lot of the novels are, uh, are very much about phantom operations and i can, I, I like to call it faction so whilst it's uh, it's a story and, uh, and there's a tale in there, it's based on real events, it's based on stuff I did, and it's based on life in the cockpit. So uh, quite a high level of detail. So um, you know if you if you've never tried aviation fiction, uh, give it a whirl because uh, otherwise uh, we'll we'll all dry up and we won't write aviation fiction because uh, not many of the publishers are keen to publish it. So give it a try if you haven't tried it before. Exactly. Yeah. So I'll I'll leave the links in below. Like when we publish this live but uh this is dave's latest book which i can highly recommend um and then hopefully in the next few months we can get dave back on the show and answer more of your questions so dave thank you very much my pleasure